Hi, everyone. I am professional photographer Ian Plant, and I'm here with Lilia Khalif from Outdoor Photography Guide. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, now this is what I think our fifth episode of OPG Live, or yeah. I don't know, I lost track. Uh, we've been <laughs> doing a few of these and uh, every time we get more and more people joining us, several hundred people around the world joining us in these live events. So thank you everyone for participating. To answer the question that is almost inevitably always asked during these live events, yes, <laughs> the event will be available on yeah. the Outdoor Photography Guide site after the fact, so you can come back and watch it later. So you certainly don't need to take any notes while you're watching me right now. And uh, I mean, it's not like I have anything that good to say anyways. Uh, but in any event, if you do think that there's something really earth shattering and profound in this episode, you can come back and watch it later at your leisure. And then you can absorb all of the good information that I'm going to give to everyone here today. So uh, I don't have really much in the way of announcements or anything exciting going on. I just recently got back from a trip to the desert in Utah. And I basically went out to find the wildest places I could. And it's a great time to visit Utah in the winter. It's very cold there, but there's also not anyone else around. So I would often go several days in the wilderness, not see a single other person, uh, which is really great for photography, not so great for conversation. Uh, what I often do when I'm in the field, I, I get this question a lot, like, what do you do when you're out in the wild by yourself for uh, several days on end? Well, uh, you know, the, the very wise have a habit of talking to the smartest person in the room. So usually I'm talking to myself most of the time anyways. And when I'm when there's no one else around, then by default, I'm always the smartest person in the room. So I actually have a lot of conversations with myself when I'm in the field. And that's fine when there's no one around. What's really embarrassing is when you're talking to yourself and you're on a trail and you turn a corner and suddenly there's a group of like 15 teenagers sitting there eating <laughs> lunch. Uh, and then you have to pretend you were on a cell phone call. Um, so uh, it can get a little lonely in the field. And uh, sometimes I like to travel with friends, uh, but I also like to have some time alone when I'm doing photography uh, because it gives me a little bit more flexibility. I can do what I want. When you're traveling with other people taking pictures, you've got great company, but you don't always have the flexibility to do what you want because everything has to be done by committee. So I do enjoy spending as much time as I can alone in the field. I think it's an important thing for people to do when they are out making pictures in nature, uh, surprisingly enough. I, 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 the reason I, I feel like being alone is a good thing is it, it's kind of a, like a personal spiritual vision quest type of thing. It's hard to explain, but you really immerse yourself in the landscape, in the, the nature that you're you're involved in taking pictures of. And I think you can attune yourself more closely to the rhythms. You're not worried about hanging out or spending time with your friends. You're, you're focused solely on making good photographs. So I think you become more productive. I think you end up uh, shooting more than you might otherwise do if you're with other people. And the result is better photographs. So I strongly encourage everyone to go on their own little mini vision quest whenever you get a chance. Traveling alone uh, can, can be frustrating and lonely and boring, but if you push past all that, you can often make some really great photographs. You don't have to be out there for weeks on end alone. It's probably okay to go maybe spend a night or two out in the wild all by yourself. Uh, taking pictures, I think you're going to find that it's a really uh, profound experience for you. So without further ado, I'm going to jump into some of the photos that I made on this uh, two-week vision quest to the Utah desert. And uh, my main interest, the reason why I picked uh, the desert of Utah for this particular shooting event was, first, I wanted to get away from the cold of Minneapolis. It's been uh, brutally cold up here, not cold enough to freeze okay. over Lake Superior. So I haven't really had a chance to go out and do any photography when, you know, like they have, there's ice caves and some of the sandstone caves on Lake Superior that you can access in the winter if the lake freezes over enough and it really hasn't frozen over enough to get to do most of that. So it's just been cold and unproductive up here. But second of all, I was really interested in flying my drone. So I wanted to go to a place that was going to be good for drone photography, but also a place where I could legally fly a drone. So I picked some BLM land in the middle of the Utah desert, and I'm going to start off showing you some of the drone photographs that I took while I was there. So let's uh, jump on in. Did you have to purchase a new drone? I thought yours escaped in, in, in Ethiopia. Oh, well, yes, yes. My <laughs> drone, my I uh, did have a bit of a crash event in Ethiopia. I was uh, hiking in the Simeon Mountains of Ethiopia and I brought my drone with me. And one day I decided to fly it. And when you're in the Simeon Mountains, you're actually up on mountains that are 14,000 14, feet above sea level. And there's about a seven or 8,000 foot drop straight down the escarpment to the valleys below. So I was flying my drone over those valleys and for some reason there was a command interference i couldn't get the drone to come back and so i sat there trying a million things Waiting. to get to fly back while the battery keeps dropping more and more 
And then eventually the battery just died. So that drone probably fell about 8,000 feet out of the sky, landing down in the wilderness below. So lucky, lucky for me, there was, there was no people down there or anything like that. So, uh, I was, monkeys. Uh, yeah, it was probably, <laughs> probably some very poor, interesting for some monkey. Down some there. poor monkeys just, yeah. It's like, Hey, what's that coming at me? Bam. <laughs> Uh, there probably wasn't any monkeys there. So it was, I'm sure no one was hurt, no monkeys, no wildlife were harmed in it, but I did lose that drone. But I did, I went out, bought another one when I came back. And so I was flying that over the Utah desert. So uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna jump- We're gonna keep track now, every drone you lose. Well, we'll make, yeah. We'll make a tally in the back. <laughs> It'll be a long list. <laughs> this is actually the second drone I've destroyed. Um, so, uh, you know, please feel free to send some questions. We've got some pre-submitted questions that we're gonna, uh, answer after I look at a few of the photos, but please send your questions in uh, during the event and uh, Lilia will read off the very best ones. So make sure they're smart questions and make sure they're funny questions. So let's jump into some of these photos I took in the Utah desert. Oops. Let's see. There we go. <laughs> so as I said, I was primarily interested in getting some aerial views of my drone. I've had a drone for uh, about a little over a year now and I just haven't done much photography with it. It's taken a while for me to integrate it into my overall workflow. Uh, so I was really uh, eager to fly it over the, the twisted sandstone landforms of the Utah desert. So what I was doing is I was looking for interesting patterns, but as I do with all my photography, I also want to find good interactions of shadow and light. So with this particular photo, I was I was flying it over some interesting yellow sandstone hills that were surrounded by these intricate drainage patterns. And I flew my drone at sunset. So this was the very last light of uh, the day hitting those yellow hills. So that warm golden sunset light hitting those hills really stands out and creates a stark contrast with the landscape around it that's mostly in shadow. And so what's going on here is the landscape, because it's in shadow, isn't getting any direct sunlight. Instead, it's getting light that's mostly reflecting from the blue sky above it. So that's why it's got this bluish cast to it. And when you're shooting in these mixed light situations, it's important to select a white balance that is going to preserve uh, that color contrast. You know, So for me, artistically, I'm always looking for opposite colors, warm versus cool colors to juxtapose in my photographs. So I select a white balance that ensures that a little bit of that blue still remains in the landscape. It doesn't really look that way to our eyes because our brains do a little bit of white balance autocorrect. So if you're looking at a like a white beach ball in the open shade, it doesn't look blue to your eyes, but it really is primarily lit by blue uh, light reflecting from the sky above. And so if you take a photograph with it, with an appropriate white balance, it'll come out looking blue. So don't always reflexively try to correct for that blue. I think in the age of digital photography, there's too much uh, warming up of, of images back in the old film days when, when the film would capture the real colors that were there. Uh, the photographers, we, we would often play these contrasting colors against one another to create really vivid, colorful photographs. So I, I take that same approach. I'm always cooling down my warm balance more than I'm warming it up. All right, so the, the next photo, this is uh, uh, the same landscape as the first photo or very nearby, uh, but I took this when there was uh, no direct light on the landscape and I was really focused on the patterns and all the colors. And this, this is why I chose this area of the desert because I knew there was this mix of colorful uh, sandstone. I think there was some volcanic activity in the past that uh, threw up a lot of colored dust into the air and it settled uh, into the, onto the ground and created these colorful uh, sandstone mounds that were eroded by the occasional rains that come through this area. So I was looking for these really interesting patterns and these intricate uh, and interesting juxtapositions of color. So here we've got those yellow hills and then the blue uh, sandstone that was surrounding them. So this was a very intricate, colorful pattern. And this is what I was really looking for when I was out making photographs. Uh, and there is just no end to these intricate patterns in the desert. Uh, they're all over the place. These were erosion. Uh, these were erosion patterns in some in some hills coming down a, a big mesa. And so I flew my drone over them, and I took a photograph during the very last bit of light before the sunset. So it's a a bit softer light than you get during the rest of the day. So the the hills are just very slightly directionally lit. But when you have light coming in from an angle like side lighting, 
then you can reveal the texture of the landscape, especially when that light is low. And these are the best times, in my opinion, to make uh, photographs of some of the patterns that you find in the landscape is when you have this directional lighting, you can choose uh, the, the harsher directional lighting, which uh, creates a much more dramatic effect, or you can do this sort of softer directional lighting like I do here, which is a softer effect. Uh, the shadows aren't quite as dark as you might otherwise have, and it brings out some more of the color that you would otherwise see in the shadows. And here's another example of looking for interesting patterns and uh, juxtapositions of color. And you know the great thing about a, a drone when you're using it for photography is that you have an infinite variety of positions that you can select. You know, when you're on the ground and you're working with a tripod, it's really difficult to get the right position, to get your camera in that exact perfect spot. It can sometimes take a while to get it right. But with a drone, you, you really just have a lot more flexibility choosing different altitudes, uh, choosing different positions, left, right, forward, and back. Uh, all these variations give you a lot of flexibility when it comes to making compositions. So this is uh, the same landscape we saw uh, previous in the, uh, the two shots that were before this, um, but it's just at a different angle. So it reveals a different pattern and uh, gives me a different take on the landscape. So here's some more uh, hills that had been eroded that I discovered. And you can see this is late light, sunset light, stronger light. So the shadows are deeper and darker. And the contrast between light and dark is, is darker, is more extreme. So this is creating a, a stronger uh, interplay of light and shadow than the previous shots where the light was softer. And so as a result, a pattern emerges only from the interaction of light and shadow. If I had taken the same photo and there had been no light on the landscape, if it had just been a cloudy day, then the shot would have been a lot less interesting. Then the pattern, the shapes would not have been as visible. It would have been a much less successful photograph. But because of the light on the very tips of the ridges of these hills, uh, a pattern emerges, the shapes emerge. So I'll always be looking at the interplay of light and shadow when you're making photographs. So this is another uh, feature that I found in the desert. And a lot of this would just be me flying around, looking uh, at the live video feed from my drone and seeing what I would see and then choosing a composition. I also spent a lot of time uh, before I left on my trip pouring over satellite maps. Google mm -hmm. Earth can be really useful because you can actually look at what landforms look like from the air and you can find interesting patterns and compositions just looking at the satellite maps that you can find online. And then you can go to the location and fly over and try to recreate what you saw. Uh, but sometimes I would just be flying my drone and looking for something interesting. And, and for this particular shot, there was a mesa that was standing straight up and it was getting the very last bit of light from the setting sun. And so I flew my drone over to the mesa and I, I actually, because it was a small mesa, I was able to fly my drone over it and look uh, more or less straight down. So what you're seeing here in this photo is the very top pyramid of the mesa lit up by the setting sun, surrounded by all these erosion patterns in the, in the hills that surround the mesa. And you can see different kind of rock at the top of the mesa. It's this red sandstone. At the bottom of the mesa, it's this blue sandstone, and there's some yellow mixed in. And then you get all these interesting colors just from the native color of the rock. And then those colors mix with the colors of the light. So you have the warm light striking the top of the mesa, enhancing that natural red color of the sandstone. So it's glowing orange in the shot. And then you have all of the blue sandstone around the mesa. Actually, it's a, it's a bentonite. It's a clay. And uh, that is, is in shadow because the sun is setting. So that's getting light mostly from the blue sky above. So that blue sky light is enhancing the native blue color of the bentonite. And the result is a very colorful juxtaposition of colors and a very interesting pattern. So uh, I always pay very close attention to shadows. And a lot of times the shadow can make the shot. So for this particular uh, photograph, I was flying my drone over this feature that I thought might be interesting. It was some sandstone fins that were standing straight up. And I thought that they would catch some really interesting light at sunset. Uh, but I couldn't really find an interesting composition until I flew my drone a little bit away from the sandstone fins. And I saw that they were casting this shadow 
and the shadow managed to fit in perfectly into the shape of the sandstone mountain that was behind the feature that I was photographing. So uh, that struck me as being an interesting shot. So the shadow is really the focus of my composition here. It creates a shape that repeats the shape of the sandstone fins uh, right in front of it. And, and the shape really, the shape of the shadow really became the central focus of my composition here. I would uh, fly a lot at sunrise and sunset, and uh, it was very, very cold. A lot of times it would get down to maybe uh, 15 or 10 degrees Fahrenheit, so, you know, good 20 degrees below freezing. So I'd wake up in the morning, there'd be frost all over my, I'd be sleeping in the back of my truck, there'd be frost all over my vehicle. And uh, it was uh, often very difficult to keep my drone batteries warm. I'd put them in my sleeping bag with me. And then when I would uh, fly the drone, because it was so cold, I was getting all sorts of interference problems. It's very, very difficult to, uh, to fly and use electronics when it's this cold. Uh, but nonetheless, I made the effort to, to make sure that I was up and in the air every time there looked like there was promising light at sunrise and sunset. And this was a big, uh, interesting sandstone mesa. So I flew out with my drone when there was sunset light. And this was in the pre-dawn, so there was a lot of light on the clouds around it. Uh, but uh, most of the light that you see on the landscape, all that red is light reflecting from the clouds that were right above the setting sun, or the rising sun rather, which was behind me. And so what happens when you get a really colorful sunrise or sunset and you've got a lot of clouds that are picking up that brilliant red and orange color, those clouds will act like a giant reflector and they will bounce the light back down onto the landscape. And you can get some very colorful uh, surreal results. It often looks rather otherworldly, these colors. So in this particular scene, even though there's a lot of red sandstone, what you're seeing here more than anything is a lot of red light reflecting off the clouds that were lighting up at sunrise, uh, bouncing down onto the landscape and giving the landscape this beautiful red hue. Now, when I wasn't flying my drone, I was doing some traditional landscape photography and I was exploring some of the side canyons that you find in Utah, there's a lot of slot canyons. Uh, winter isn't usually the best time for most slot canyons because the light is very low during the middle of the day. And a lot of times the sun doesn't get up quite high enough to get down into the canyon. The, the trick, the key to, to successful slot canyon photography is to have a brilliant blue sky day. You don't want, you don't want to have clouds. You want to have a beautiful, clear blue sky day and what you want is a lot of strong sunlight hitting the rocks that are at the top of the canyon because the canyon will bounce that light down into the deeper parts of the canyon that are in the shadows. So when you see slot canyon photos and you see this brilliant red or orange glow in the rocks, that's what's going on there. You're getting this reflected light bouncing down and the, you need really strong light for that to happen. So if there's a few clouds in the sky, they will soften the light, they will break up the light and reduce the light's intensity. So really even just a few stray clouds can ruin the whole effect. So you want a crystal clear day. Also, you want it to be crystal clear because you don't want to be caught in a slot canyon if it rains, there's a, there's a chance of a flash flood. So you want to make sure that it's a nice clear day before you go into a slot canyon. And so uh, actually Sorry. I wasn't done with that one. Bad Lily. <laughs> Seemed like a break. <laughs> <laughs> so one of my favorite canyons in the area is this charming little slot canyon called Leprechaun Canyon. It's actually a really long slot, but most of the slot is very technical and narrow, so narrow that it's hard to get through it. And unless you, you're a leprechaun. Unless you're a leprechaun. Uh, and uh, it's also very difficult to set up your camera in something that narrow. It's pretty much impossible. So the part that's easily accessible is, is relatively small slot canyon. So this is me. Uh, this is a self portrait I took of myself at the entrance to the, the area where the canyon slots up. So here the, the canyon was a little bit wider, but talking once again about how shadows can create shapes. I was attracted to the teardrop shape that was formed by the shadow in the canyon. So you've got one wall of canyon that's lit up and then you've got the rest of the canyon in the shadow. So I went very wide. I took out my fisheye lens and I was wide enough to be able to include the entire teardrop shape of the shadow. And I also used a little bit of foreground. There's a, a bit of a pattern in the, the, the ground of the canyon. This is an erosion pattern where water 
was carving through the rock. So I used that as a bit of a leading line, but I needed it to lead somewhere interesting. So I put myself in the picture. So what I did is I set up my 10 second timer on my camera. I would trigger the shutter. I would run out into position and then I would strike as manly a pose as I possibly could. Uh, this is your manly pose? That's, uh, okay, well, I, that's <laughs> as manly as I get. Uh, actually, I tried some other more manly variations. This is per, a little bit less manly. But, There's no arm flexing, no nothing going on. Well, you know, I don't I don't need to like flex. <laughs> you just, you exude. I exude manliness. Okay. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, Lilia was good, just going to leave it at you exude. Um, <laughs> and so I would uh, go and uh, strike an interesting position if it's not manly. Uh, this is a bit of advice that works well for the ladies as well as the men. When you're striking a position, always make sure, suck in your gut, and put your chest out. That'll make you look as impressive as you possibly can for your self portraits. Uh, and so this way I have a, a visual element that is at the end of the line. The leading line in the foreground pushes the eye to the person in the background, it happens to be me. So that, that helps makes the composition more interesting. And by putting myself in the middle of that teardrop shape, I really make that shape uh, a strong part of the composition. Are we ready for the next we one? We are ready for the next one. <laughs> so as I went deeper into the canyon, you can see that I was beginning to get that reflected glow. So there's a bit of glow in the background. So I was playing around with the shapes that I found in the canyon. So I was really attracted to this, this strong leading line. There was some sand in one of the erosion channels. So I used that with a wide angle lens as the main compositional shape in this particular photograph. So it leads from the foreground and it curves all the way into the background, leading the eye throughout the entire scene. So it's important to think about the shapes, but it's also important when you're making compositions to think about how you can lead the eye from the foreground to the background, from the bottom to the top of the image. And usually the best way to lead the eye is not go directly from point A to point B. Uh, you know, I like to avoid uh, using lines too much. I prefer to to use something that gets the eye moving a bit more on the way, like a curve or a zigzag, uh, something that forces the eye to meander as it's traveling from foreground to background. So I, I spent two days photographing inside this canyon, and I did so because I wanted to see what the light was like in various parts of the canyon at different times of the day. And so once I realized when the peak light occurred, uh, by the time I, I figured that all out, it was too late to get the shot I wanted. So I came back another day and I was in position for the shot that I had scouted previously. I was there when the light peaked. And so what I was looking for here in the middle of the day, some sunbeams actually managed to, to come through the opening at the top of the slot and make it all the way down to the bottom of the slot. And so I have this narrow sunbeam that's actually hitting some of the sand inside the slot canyon. And when it did that, uh, suddenly that part of the sand and the canyon walls right next to it were much, much brighter than the rest of the canyon. So they were glowing with light. And this is something that you wouldn't really see if you were out in uh, an open area and your eyes were adjusted to the brightness, you wouldn't notice it. But in the, in the gloomy interior of this cave, of this slot canyon, my eyes were adjusted to the darkness. And so it was very visible. You could see how all of the, the rock around the sunbeam started glowing with this reflected light, this bounce light. And so that was the moment when I triggered the shutter. And what I liked about this particular photo, not only was the, was the brilliant red glowing uh, part of the center of the slot canyon, but there were these strong lines that were coming in from the foreground. So you've got this curvy line coming in from the lower left, another curvy line coming from the right, and then the, the little bit of reflected light line coming in through the middle. These three lines were the result of this reflected light that was coming in the canyon, not only from the sunbeam, but also from light reflecting in from the sky above. So the lines were created by the light and the shadow that was in the interior of the cave. So these three lines coming together, pushing the eye in, leading to that very bright center uh, is a compositional style that I like to use a lot with my photos. And then there was another canyon I went to explore. Uh, that The first one was Leprechaun Canyon, and this one is called uh, Little Wild Horse Canyon. And Little Wild Horse is a beautiful slot canyon. Unfortunately, uh, winter is not the best time to be there. I think it gets better light in uh, probably in the summer and uh, when, the, when, the, when the sun is higher in the sky because there's this big mountain that's in the way in the winter. But I did have a moment where I was getting some interesting reflected light and I was able to play with the patterns 
in the striations in the rock. So sandstone is really beautiful, not only because it's colorful, but because it, it gets sculpted easily by the water. It's a very soft rock. So you get all these fluted patterns uh, that radiate out when you use a wide angle lens. So they radiate, create these lines and curves that radiate from the corners and the edges into the center of the composition. So it's a real powerful visual effect. All right, so back to my aerial shots from the desert. There was one particular mesa that I found that was absolutely beautiful. It was a stunning mesa. It just stood up from the landscape around it. It really dominated the landscape. And there were all these badlands all around it. It was surrounded for miles with these long badlands. So I knew that this was going to be the shot that was going to bring the whole trip together. So I, I worked very hard. I worked this particular location, camped out there for four or five nights. Uh, every morning, every sunset, I was out there flying my drone, hoping to get some interesting clouds. I don't want uh, a sunny, clear day. That's a great day for the tourists, and it's a great day for photographing slot canyons, but for photographing the landscape, uh, usually not a very good option. What I wanted was a lot of clouds in the sky, not so much that they were blocking up sunrise or sunset, but I needed something to catch that light at sunrise and sunset to create some contrast and visual interest in the sky. And another thing you get when you've got a lot of clouds in the sky, you can get stronger light. If you're out photographing on a completely sunny morning, you might get some strong, colorful light for a few minutes when the sun first comes above the horizon. If the horizon is clear and there's no haze, you might get some pretty strong light, but it really isn't that strong. The strongest light you can get on a landform is if the sun is rising, there's, a, there's clouds above it, but there's a crack in the clouds. So you're getting direct light from the sun hitting the landform, but there's also a lot of light hitting the clouds above the sun. And that light is being reflected by the clouds onto the landscape as well. And that's when you get the most colorful, the strongest, most intense light you'll ever get as a landscape photographer. You need those clouds to bounce the light, to enhance the light and really bring out those strong colors. So clear days, not very good for uh, landscape photography typically. So on this particular morning, I was lucky there were lots of clouds in the sky. There was a gap on the horizon where the sun was rising. So I had some nice, strong, colorful yellow light from the morning sun hitting the mesa in the background and striking just the top of the hills that were in the foreground. So the light on the hills creates these leading lines that lead the eye from the foreground to the background. So I had really great light on the landscape. I had these dark, gloomy, blue, stormy clouds in the background, which was nice. But what I really wanted was some colorful light on the clouds in the background. So this, this was a good shot. I'm happy with it, but it wasn't quite what I was looking for. So I kept working at it. And then later on that evening, it was very cloudy. And um, I was worried that I wasn't going to get any light. But once again, a small gap opened up where the sun was going down. So I knew that I was going to get some good light at sunset. But the question was, when was it going to happen? Was I going to get any light on the landscape itself or was I just going to get some color in the clouds? So what happened is uh, I didn't get the light on the landscape. I just ended up getting some light on the clouds. So this is the other side of the mesa. I was on the back side of it, different composition. I've got some hills in the foreground. I went for something that was a bit softer of a composition. So I didn't have these really powerful lines pushing from foreground to background. Instead, I had a kind of a more gentle, a subtler progression of it, visual elements that, that leads from foreground to background. So it's a softer compositional effect. And I didn't really have any light on the, the landscape itself, but I did have some great color in the sky about 10 minutes after the sun set. So I got the color in the sky this time. I didn't really get the color in the foreground that I wanted. So once again, a nice shot, but not quite what I wanted. So finally, my last morning photographing uh, this Mesa, I got what I wanted. I got both light on the landscape and light on the clouds behind the landscape. And so this is the shot that I'd been dreaming about. This is the shot that I really wanted to make happen. And I got that light I was talking about. There were a lot of clouds in the sky. There was a gap on the horizon. So there was some direct light coming through that gap on the horizon, but there was also so much color in the clouds, that the clouds were acting like a giant reflector. So for this particular shot, what you're really seeing is all of that reflected light 
hitting the landscape. The reflected light was so strong. This was before the sun rose. The reflected light was so strong uh, from just the clouds lighting up that it actually looks like direct light on the landscape. There's even a bit of a shadow there. That's how strong that reflected light can get. And when you've got that, that reflected light, uh, you get a lot of unearthly colors on the landscape. So I had these, these beautiful pinks in the sky behind it lighting up. I had this reddish glow on the landscape. I had a really great foreground pushing the eye from the bottom of the image frame into the center of the composition. Everything came together perfectly, and that's the shot I wanted. So it took a little bit of patience and it took some perseverance. Uh, but basically what I tell people all the time is great photography starts in the mind of the photographer. And then it's just a matter of working hard and waiting until the real world lines up with your artistic vision. So that does it. Uh, we're gonna pause and answer some questions, Lilia. All right, we have some pre-submitted questions, so we'll answer them first, but as always, start adding them in the chat and we'll get through as many as we can in the time that we have. So start answering your questions in the chat and we'll get to them. But first, we have a question from Dennis who asks, what do you recommend in the use of fil filters in landscape photography? Dennis, thank you, that's a fantastic question. So filters are something that were used by landscape photographers a lot back in the days of film. Uh, we needed to use filters to control the light and to balance the light. Uh, they become less common in the age of digital, but there are still a few filters that I use in my photography. So one filter that I recommend you have is a polarizer filter because it's not something that you can easily replicate uh, in the digital darkroom. So what a polarizer is designed to do is remove reflections and glare from a scene. Now, I don't use a polarizer for most of my shots. Usually I'm only using a polarizer when I'm photographing uh, waterfalls or streams with a lot of foliage around them, like spring trees or autumn foliage. And I do that, I use the polarizer because when you're shooting something that is wet, you'll have a lot of glare on wet surfaces. So you might have a lot of rocks, they're wet, and the glare is light reflecting from the sky above. So if you're shooting waterfalls, typically you're shooting on a cloudy day. And so you have all this white light that is being reflected on these white surfaces. And that white light creates glare that's unattractive. So you can use the polarizer to remove those reflections and enhance the native color of the scene. So I use a polarizer usually only in those specific circumstances. Uh, a lot of people will use a polarizer to darken a blue sky. I think that's a bad idea because uh, often what happens, is, especially if you're working with a wide angle lens, you get uneven polarization of the sky because the amount of polarization differs with the angle the filter is from the sun and with a wide angle scene, you have parts of the scene that are at different angles from the sun. So one half of the image might polarize very darkly and the other half won't polarize at all. So you get this uneven polarization. What I recommend that people do is instead of using a polarizer to darken that blue sky, they can use uh, tools in Lightroom or Adobe Photoshop or in their image processing program to selectively darken the blues and that way you can get that polarizer effect without getting that uneven polarization. Another filter that I sometimes use is a neutral density filter. And a neutral density filter is just a neutral gray filter that cuts down on the amount of light coming in. So if you want to do a long exposure effect, you use a neutral density filter to make your exposure longer. It cuts down on the light. It forces you to select a, a longer shutter speed to get the proper exposure. And that way you can do long exposure effects. A lot of photographers still use what's known as a graduated neutral density filter, which is like a neutral density filter, but it's only dark uh, on the top half of the filter. And that's designed to balance the light. So if you've got a, a brilliant sunrise, for example, and you've got very bright clouds, but a, a dark landscape that's in the shadow, uh, you use the filter to balance that light to make sure that all of the range of light to dark in the scene can be captured by your camera sensor. And I don't use these filters that much anymore. A lot of photographers, what they prefer to do instead of using a graduated neutral density filter is to instead take two exposures and blend them using Adobe Photoshop, uh, or you can blend them in Lightroom using uh, Merge to HDR. And these tools are very effective. They can often give you a much more natural looking blend than you can get with a graduated filter because a graduated filter, you pull it down, 
over the horizon, if you've got trees or mountains sticking up into the sky, those will go dark as well. And so the effect isn't always that realistic. So I prefer to do uh, exposure blending because it gives me more flexibility and it allows me to get a more realistic look. Uh, filters you definitely don't need to, to ever buy. You don't need to buy any sort of like color correction or, or enhancing filters or anything like that because you can just do that digitally. There's, there's no reason that, you know, we used to have these filters, they called them enhancing filters that would intensify the colors. Uh, this is what we used in the days of film, but now all you need to do is just take the vibrance or saturation slider and push it up and you'll get the same effect. So if anyone tries to like sell you a, a color enhancing filter or an intensifying filter, just ignore them and walk away. It's a marketing ploy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hit two birds with one stone there. We had a question about neutral density filters, so you answered it all in one. All two right, we're being really one. efficient. We're, I guess we're done then, thank you. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. go ahead. Our next question is from Ryan asking, how do you take photos of star trails? Oh, well, that's, uh, that's a good question. Thank Very you, specific. Ryan. Yes. Uh, so star trails do require long exposures. So uh, when people photograph the stars, they do it two, one of two different ways. Usually what you see most often are what I call static star field shots, which is a shot of the Milky Way, the stars in the sky, and you're looking for pinpoints of light as opposed to trails. So what happens is uh, you know, everything in the, in the sky is moving, but uh, the motion that we perceive as the stars move across the sky at night is because of the earth spinning on its axis. So we're, we're really the ones causing the stars to move in the sky. And so you need to have a short exposure to get those pinpoints of light. So if you're doing a static star field shot, I recommend people shoot with a wide open aperture like F2.8 or F4, bump up their ISO to maybe 3200, and shoot at 30 seconds or less. And that's the best way to get those pinpoints of light. But another way you can shoot stars is to let that spinning motion of the earth uh, play into the shot. And what you do is you do a long exposure, longer than 30 seconds, and this causes the stars to create trails. And star trails are a lot of fun. Uh, and if you point your camera, if, if you're in the Northern hemisphere, if you point your camera towards the North star with a long enough exposure, all of the stars in the sky will create these concentric trails, these circles around the North Star. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, you've got a point roughly at the Southern Cross, but it's, there's not quite that same uh, perfect way of aligning your photos easily as you have in the Northern Hemisphere. In any event, you basically have to point your camera due North or due South to get those concentric circles. And you need a long exposure. So you can run an exposure of a few minutes and you'll see these tiny little trails or you can run an exposure for several hours and you get these longer trails, you get these beautiful concentric circles if you run the camera long enough. Your main problem with that is, well, there's two problems. One is battery power. Your battery is gonna run out probably after an hour or two, uh, depending on what kind of system you have. You can hook up an external battery with some cameras and run your exposures longer. Your second problem is that digital cameras don't really handle long exposures very well. They heat up and that heat causes this, uh, this noise to build up, this random pattern of dots, colorful dots. And if it gets warm enough and you run an exposure long enough, those dots will overwhelm the image. And so there's two ways you can deal with that. One, you can use uh, long exposure noise reduction. It's a feature that's on most digital cameras. And so what happens is you take a shot, let's say you take an hour long star shot, and then after that shot is done, the camera will take another hour long shot. It won't actually expose the sensor to any light, but it's gonna run the shot for an hour and it's gonna figure out where all of that noise builds up during that exposure from the heat on the sensor. And then it, then it digitally subtracts that noise from the first shot. And this works pretty well uh, sometimes, uh, but it means that your one hour exposure turns into a two hour exposure. So we get to the battery problem. Another thing you can do is do star trails when it's cold outside. So I've done star trails in the winter when it's below freezing, your sensor never really warms up enough to get that noise that can overwhelm the image. Uh, so a lot of photographers will sometimes hook up an ice pack to their cameras if they're doing long star trails. A better way of doing star trails, instead of actually keeping your shutter open for this long period of time, is to take a bunch of shorter shots and then blend them together on the computer to create that star trail effect. So what you do is you take the settings that you would normally use for the static star field shot, you know, your widest aperture, F2.8, F4, ISO 1600 or 3200, 
a 15 or a 30 second exposure and you run a bunch of shots and then you combine them on the computer. There's a free program out there called Star Stacks, I think, or Star Stack. I think it's Star Stacks. Specifically for stars. Yeah, specifically for stars. And you don't have to be a star yourself. You don't have to be <laughs> famous to use it. It's for the stars in the heavens. And uh, this will automatically blend the shots together and it'll fill in these gaps because sometimes there are uh, there might be a one or a two second delay between exposures. So it'll fill in the gaps and create these beautiful star trail images. That way you can just let your camera run shot after shot after shot until the battery dies. Uh, if your battery dies while you're doing a long exposure, you lose the exposure. But this way you can take several hundred exposures uh, and then on that last exposure when your battery dies, you lose that one shot, but you still have three or 400 mm -hmm. shots from before. You combine them using the program and you have a beautiful star trail image. Huzzah. Huzzah. <laughs> <laughs> Our next question is from Felipe who asks, if neither your technique nor your abilities are outstanding, plus your eyesight is not what it used to be, how can you tell if your landscape photography is perfectly focused? Unless of course you ask somebody to look through the viewfinder for you. Okay. Uh, Philippe, that's a, that's a very good, good question. Uh, and uh, I think the, the answer is, well, get first of all, yeah, yeah, well, there's, yeah, get eye <laughs> surgery. That's what I did many years ago. Uh, so obviously there's a lot of cameras with autofocus. I, I do know some people who have eyesight problems who rely very heavily on their autofocus to, uh, to make sure that they've got a uh, focus set on where they want it set. Now, the real challenge with landscape photography isn't so much focusing somewhere. It's usually pretty easy either through autofocus or manual focus to focus somewhere. You have to focus on the right place to make sure you get that deep, sharp focus from near to far. And this is something called hyperfocal distance, which is an incredibly complex uh, topic. Uh, I highly recommend if you really want to learn about how to get that deep, sharp focus look for landscape, check out my course available on the Outdoor Photography Guide shop, Focusing for Landscape Photography. It talks about hyperfocal distance, it talks about aperture, and it talks about focus stacking, which was my next recommendation. Uh, instead of going through all the trouble with hyperfocal distance, which can be very, very difficult, I suppose, if you have some eyesight problems, instead, you might wanna consider focus stacking, which is taking a bunch of exposures of the same scene but with the focus point set at different places and then merging them together uh, using a, a program like, um, I use Helicon Focus. So Helicon Focus is a really great program for doing focus stacking. That takes a lot of the guesswork out of it and it gives you that, that near far sharpness. Uh, so it's not really a question of technique or ability, it's really just a question of how much effort you wanna put into making sure you have all that focus correct. So I do recommend checking out my course, Focusing for Landscape Photography. It demystifies all this stuff, explains it very clearly. I think it's a good idea to learn how to do hyperfocal distance and also learn how to do focus stacking because there are times when you can't focus stack. If you're shooting uh, fast, you don't have time to do multiple uh, focus exposures. Or if you've got a scene with a lot of moving elements and you need to capture everything with one shot, it's very important to understand how hyperfocal distance and aperture affects your depth of field and, and how you can use that to get that sharp focus look. But uh, definitely check out Focusing for Landscape Photography. I, I you know, I, I get these questions all the time about hyperfocal distance. And I know I always punt because it's a very complex, <laughs> we could spend a whole hour talking about it and you'd still be confused. So I do recommend checking out Focusing for Landscape Photography available on the Outdoor Photography Guide shop. Tell you all you need to know. All right, our next question is from William asking, Ian, do you have any recommendations for ultra wide angle lenses other than Canon 1124 F4 lens? The $2,700 price tag is a little steep. Thanks for your advice. <laughs> okay, this is a fantastic question. So right now, I mean, it really depends on what kind of camera system you're using. If you're using a full frame camera like I am, then the Canon 11 to 24 is the widest angle lens you can buy that's not a fisheye lens. Uh, as a matter of fact, it is the widest angle lens you can get for any camera system. Uh, it offers an angle of view that's unparalleled, but you don't really need to always shoot at 11, though I found that as soon as I bought that lens, suddenly I'm shooting everything at 11 millimeters. It's kind of <laughs> crazy how that works. Um, unfortunately, these ultra wide angle lenses are rather expensive, especially for the full frame because they have to have a special design. So your other options for an ultra wide for a full frame camera are the, there is the Nikon 14 to 24 millimeter, and of course you can use that if you're a Nikon user. I used to use that lens on my Canon camera 
with an adapter. You can adapt a Nikon lens to a Canon camera. You can't do it the other way around. And uh, it's a very, you know, it was a it was a earth shattering lens when that lens came out. It was the sharpest, best ultra wide angle lens for a long period of time. And uh, and a lot of Canon users use that lens on their Canon cameras, or they switch to Nikon just for that lens. Uh, but then Canon answered with the 11 to 24, which is an incredibly sharp lens, beautiful lens. Uh, and it goes to 11, so <laughs> you can't beat that. <laughs> uh, your other options are Tamron has got an excellent 15 to 30 millimeter f2.8. Uh, that really competes more with the Nikon 14 to 24 because it's a 2.8 lens and, it, and it's much closer in focal range to the Nikon than the Canon. So you can't go quite as wide. Uh, and then Sigma also has a 12 to 24 millimeter lens. I uh, owned the first version of that lens many, many years ago. Uh, and it wasn't really that sharp, but now the, uh, you know, Sigma's really up their game in recent years. I haven't used their most recent version of that lens, but uh, it's probably a pretty good lens and I'm sure it's a lot cheaper than the Canon lens. Now, if you are shooting with a crop sensor camera, your options get a bit cheaper. Uh, you don't have anything that's quite as wide in effective focal length as the Canon 11 to 24, and I don't know off the top of my head uh, what these, uh, these lenses are. I do have a, a great course uh, called The Ultra Wide Landscape that talks all about ultra wide landscape photography. And it does talk about some of your lens options for both full frame and for crop sensor cameras. So if you're really interested in ultra wide photography, I highly recommend you check out that course available once again on the Outdoor Photography Guide shop. All right, we're gonna move into some questions from the chat. A lot in general about the drone and the equipment you use with right. the drone. So could you talk about the camera you used on the drone to take the shots and if you used any filters while using the drone? Okay, so the drone I'm flying is DJI's Phantom 4 Pro drone. And the reason why I'm flying that is because it's got the biggest sensor available in their consumer line or prosumer line of drones. So it has a one inch sensor. That's a bigger sensor than the the smaller sensors that most drones have. Uh, a one inch sensor is still pretty small compared to the full frame 35 millimeter sensors I'm using in my Canon cameras. Uh, but it, it's definitely a step up from the smaller 12 megapixel sensors that you find in most of DJI's other drones and, and also other drones in the market. The next step up if you want a bigger sensor is you have to buy the Inspire series that DJI offers and you're, you're talking about a $3,000 drone and then a $3,000 camera to get a, a, a bigger sensor with more image quality. So that's a significant investment if you want to go there. So DJI Phantom 4 Pro, there's also the DJI Phantom Advanced, which is also has that, that 20 megapixel one inch sensor. So uh, when I'm flying my drone, I'm actually not using any filters on it. Um, I think that sometimes if you're taking photographs during the middle of the day, you might need a neutral density filter or a polarizer filter to help cut down on the light and the glare coming in. But I'm doing most of my shooting at sunrise or sunset, so I don't have a problem with that. Uh, my problem is usually the opposite. I don't have enough light and my mm -hmm. I end up using a high ISO. And with a small sensor, uh, like the one inch sensor on the Phantom 4 Pro, you really want to avoid high ISOs if you can because the, the sensor starts getting really noisy. So the image quality isn't as great. So I'm, I'm usually trying to find that balance, uh, trying to keep my ISO as low as possible and my exposure as bright as possible to make sure I've got a really clean file. All right. And you also talked a bit about, and we have in like the Star Trails discussion as well, mm -hmm. talking about charging your batteries in the field or like you put your batteries in your sleeping bag with you to keep them warm. But do you have any um, suggestions or talk about like the power sources you use? Like do you take something that you can recharge your batteries in the field with? Or what are you doing when you run out of battery charge in the field? Okay, so um, there's From Peter. Okay, well, thank you, <laughs> Peter. That is a fantastic question. I, I think um, we I actually shot a video uh, a free web clip for uh, OPG that should be released sometime soon that talks about this exact topic. So there's two different versions of the field. There's when I'm car camping, and then if I'm in my vehicle, I can bring a, an inverter so I can plug that into the cigarette lighter and I can charge my batteries using that. That's easy. When I'm in the wilderness away from any sort of power source, uh, what I do is I bring a small portable solar panel with me okay. that attaches to a aux auxiliary battery. And I charge that up, and when the battery's all charged up, it has enough charge uh, 
to charge up my, my cell phone maybe five or six times, charge up my iPad a few times. It also has enough power to charge up my Canon batteries. And so what I did is I went out and bought a third party accessory that is a USB charger for Canon cameras. You can also get them for Nikon and other camera brands. And then I can plug that USB cord into the auxiliary battery that connects to my solar charger. So I can charge my batteries when I'm in the field using that solar power source. And if it's a bright sunny day, that solar power panel will charge up my auxiliary battery within you know five or six hours. Um, even if it's not that sunny, if I have it out all day, it'll charge up enough so that I can keep my camera batteries nicely charged. Now, the camera batteries uh, usually handle the cold pretty well. So if it's really cold, I will put the batteries in my sleeping bag with me or I'll carry spare batteries uh, under my jacket when I'm hiking around. But for the most part, I find that the lithium ion batteries that most cameras use these days actually perform very well in the cold. So I'm not too worried about it. Uh, with my drone, those batteries are really twitchy. Uh, even though they're lithium ion batteries, the drone has a sensor. It senses that the batteries are cold and gives you all sorts of warnings when the batteries are cold and it won't fly as far as a result. So I have to be extra careful with the drone batteries when it's cold out. But with the camera batteries, uh, I usually don't worry about it that much. You can leave them out in the cold. As, you know, Maybe it's a good idea to put them in your pocket for a few minutes and warm them up before using them in the morning or something like that. But by and large, I don't think about the cold as much. All right. Um, looking back at some of the photos that we showed today, Phil asks, what are your thoughts on eccentric compositions? You seem to like to center your shots a lot. So any thoughts on off-center photos? Well, that, that is uh, an excellent observation. And uh, I, do, I do like centered compositions. I think centered compositions are very much maligned for a very poor reason. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of people out there that say you should never have a centered composition. I think that's bad, bad advice. I think centered compositions can be very interesting but you need to have stuff that's away from the center to help create some visual interest. But the, the advantage of a, of a centered composition is that it pulls the visual attention into the center of the image frame and holds onto it over time. So this is a very strong, powerful visual effect. Um, so there's a lot of people that are giving bad advice about avoiding centered compositions. You should, you should consider centered compositions when it makes sense. Uh, and, um, and if you're going to do it, you got to do it right. But there's no reason why you shouldn't do it. Uh, but I do also like, uh, as you put it, eccentric compositions uh, that are a little bit off-centered. So, you know, the landscapes I was working with in Utah, I think they kind of lent themselves more towards a, a centered composition effect. But I do often use these off-centered compositions. I like eccentric compositions. As far as I'm concerned, as long as it works, then go for it. If it doesn't work, who cares what rule you're using to get there? <laughs> if it doesn't work, it just doesn't work. Uh, so, you know, if you go through the images, I, I, you know, I've definitely got a bit of a centered kick going on. Sometimes I, I drift back and forth between compositional styles. Uh, if you look through my image files, you'll see a lot of centered compositions, but you'll also see some of the quirky or off-center compositions as well. All right. Just want to mention again, as Sue asked in the chat, that you can watch the webinar afterwards. If you're joining us late, this webinar will be available on the OPG website to watch at any time. So if you missed the beginning, you can catch it right there. And if you absolutely cannot go a day without hearing my voice, <laughs> then you can watch that video as many times as you want to. On repeat. You can watch all the old ones. You can just have a cue. Binge watching. Um, reference back to the drone. Does the camera on the drone you use capture RAW? Yes, uh, so that's another consideration if you're if you're thinking about getting a drone. And, and you know, uh, just to backtrack, I was initially skeptical when drones first started becoming popular. And look and, at you now, you've had three. I know, <laughs> I know. And I think a lot of photographers are very skeptical about it. Uh, you know, for me, I thought, well, it's maybe a bit of a gimmick. And and to be honest with you, I think drones can be kind of annoying. They're They're a little noisy. I almost always try to fly them when there aren't people around. I go to these wilderness areas, and if there's someone else there and I want to fly my drone, I have a conversation with them about it because I've, you know, I've tried really hard not to bother people, but I've had people just come up and yell at me, tell me that I ruined their day because I flew the drone, even though I made every effort to walk away. You know, I was a quarter mile away and, and wow. it, you know, people really hate it right now. It's kind of like the way cell phones were 10 years ago when, when, when someone was talking on the, on the cell phone, you get a lot of snarky comments from people. It really like people. Now people have internalized it and it's no big deal. Uh, we'll get there with drones maybe. But uh, so I was initially skeptical until I had a guy show up on one of my uh, my photo tours in Patagonia. Uh, not I'm sorry, not in Patagonia, in Argentina, uh, in the desert of Argentina. 
and he had a drone. And my first thought was, oh, this is going to be so annoying. <laughs> but then I saw what it could do. And I was like, wow, that's really Change amazing. Changed my mind. Definitely. Um, so uh, I know that's a very long digression. Uh, getting back to your question. Uh, now, now, I think, you know, drones can be a very serious tool for photographers. I think definitely you should look for a drone that offers RAW. So the Phantom 4 Pro does offer RAW. I think most of the DJI line of, of drones, like the Maverick and the, the Phantom drones, all offer RAW capabilities. So that's an important thing to be able to shoot RAW because it gives you more flexibility when you're processing the image. And look for the biggest sensor you can find. Or that you can afford. <laughs> or that you can afford. Yeah, there you go. Uh, question from Lewis. Do you use slash recommend any app on a cell phone to prepare for your photo shoot, photo shoot or could you talk about how you prepare before you leave for a trip to oh, plan out what you're going to shoot? Uh, fantastic question. Uh, I actually did an article for Outdoor Photography Guide that is on the website now, which is called Planning for Landscape Photography or something like that. You might want to check that out. Uh, so what I do when, before I go somewhere, the first thing I do is I start looking at satellite maps. That gives me an idea of what the terrain looks like. So I'm using Google Earth or I'm using just like Bing Maps or, you know, Google Maps or whatever. Uh, and I go into the satellite view because I want to get a look, I, you know, get a feel for the landscape. And then sometimes I will do a Google Images search. I don't really want to look at what other photographers have done because I don't want to have my personal vision infected by other personal visions, but I do like to get a look at the landscape. And if you do a Google Images search, usually what happens is you get a lot of tourist shots. So that way I can kind of get a feel for what it looks like without looking at other pro shots or serious photographer shots that might infect my personal vision. Uh, and when I'm on location, I do use a few apps to help. So one app that a lot of photographers use that I use occasionally is called the Photographer's Ephemeris. And this app uh, allows you to pull up satellite maps that show you where the sun is rising and where it's setting. Uh, you can even find out when and where the moon is rising and setting or the Milky Way uh, in the sky. It's a pretty useful app. I use it not that often. I tend not to be a big planner. I tend to, I tend to like to get a feel for the area, but then just go and explore and immerse myself in the, in the landscape and react to the light and get into the rhythm of things. So I tend not to plan my shots as much as some other photographers do. So I will use Photographer's Ephemeris, but more often than not, I usually just am pulling up a mapping app on my phone and looking at the satellite map just to get a feel for what the landscape looks like. And then of course, the other critically important ingredient to landscape photography is the weather. So if there's an app that I use more than anything when I'm planning my landscape shots, it's my weather apps. And what I'm looking for is, you know, for most of my landscape shots, I'm looking for partly to mostly cloudy skies. I'm looking for systems moving in or breaking up when sunrise or sunset happens. So I am pouring over the weather satellite maps constantly to try to get a feel for when I'm gonna get the clouds that I want. All right, I think we have time for one more question. All right. I'll read another one from the chat, another one from Phil. Have you tried landscape images using a longer focal length? For example, taking pictures of far off drones, et cetera. But I think he means taking pictures with a long focal length with a drone. Um, well, so if you're shooting with a drone, uh, most drones don't allow you to change your focal length, though some of the higher end drones, those expensive ones I was talking about earlier, do allow you to change your uh, lenses. Uh, there's interchangeable lenses for those. But generally, you know, most of my landscape work, as you probably have guessed, is with a super wide angle lens. I'm a wide angle guy. I do on occasion use longer lenses. I think having a short telephoto lens, like a 70 to 200 or a 100 to 400, is a really good thing for landscape. And sometimes I do use it. I just am very heavily skewed on the wide angle side of things. And the reason I like wide angle is because it allows you to uh, play with the relative scale of objects. And this can create some very compelling compositions. You can get close to a foreground element and by getting close, you make it look much bigger and more prominent than it really is. And it creates this really strong visual juxtaposition between your foreground element and your background scenery. And that powerful visual uh, juxtaposition, I think is very effective. And that's why I tend to gravitate towards wide angle lenses when I'm shooting landscape. But there's definitely a lot of great opportunities out there for shooting with longer focal lengths. So I, I definitely do it when the situation calls for it. And I strongly encourage everyone to try different focal lengths, including the wide angles and the short telephoto zoom ranges. All right. And with that, we're out of questions and out of time. All right. So. <laughs> well, fantastic. 
Thank you so very much for joining us. This has been another great session and it's really you, the viewer, uh, and all your great questions that make these episodes what they are. So thank you and I hope to see you again. We'll be back next month. I'll have many more exciting images and stories to share with you. And as always, I'm gonna do my best to share my tips and techniques for making compelling photographs. I'm here to help you make the photos you've always dreamed of making. I'm Ian Plant. I'm Lilia Khalif. And thanks for watching. <laughs> Bye. Bye.